Hey everyone, welcome back for another week of Freedom Church Online. It's great that you're able to join us today and I am so looking forward to week one in our new sermon series, 12 Stones, where we will be looking at 12 truths from God's word that remind us who he is, what he's done and who we are in him. If you missed last week's message, you need to catch up on that one as it sets the context for the whole series on truth. Can you believe it's exactly a year ago today where we had our last worship service at Holyer School? What a year of change we've seen across the globe. We've had to adapt again and again, and we have grieved the loss of in-person contact. You know, Hebrews 10 heads up a passage with the words, a call, to persevere. And in verses 23 to 25, it says the following, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. It's twofold. You will be encouraged by meeting with others. And here's the crucial message. Your presence and what you bring, as small as you may think it is, encourages those in the Zoom room with you. So let's continue to fight for each other in this way. It's never too late to join a life group or gather with others on Zoom to pray. If you'd like to find out how to become part of a group, then please contact us. We are fighting for you, but we can't do it for you. We are now able to have up to 40 people meeting at Freedom Center. Those who come love the opportunity for fellowship. There is definitely a different atmosphere being together in the auditorium rather than being in our living rooms. We still can't sing out loud, but we can certainly stand together, raise our hands and hum a great worship song in our masks. Please make sure you sign up for next week to avoid disappointment. Now, in just a moment, Kirsten is going to lead us in worship. But before we go there, can I encourage you to join me at one of our four church prayer times? I wrestle with prayer so much that I've committed to be at each of our prayer times. So why don't you join me on Zoom, Mondays 6.30 to 7 a.m., Wednesdays 7 to 7.30 p.m., Fridays 6.30 to 7 a.m., and of course, Sunday mornings from 9 to 9.30 a.m. Prayer is so essential for our growth, both as individuals and as a church. So see you there. Now, let's worship together. Those at Freedom Center are going to be on their feet. So let's join them as we raise our hearts and hands in worship.
Hi everyone and welcome to Meet the Family. Such a great way to connect with so many of our church members and I hope you're enjoying meeting some maybe new faces to you too. This week I'm speaking to Jonathan and Lizette Morales and they're two wonderful girls. I hope you enjoy getting to know them. Hi guys! Hi Alex! Hello! Hi! Hey, hello <laughs> nice to see you. Can you just introduce yourselves please? Hi, I'm Jonathan. I'm Lizette. And I'm Karen. Ah, nice to meet you all, guys. And um, Jonathan and Lizette, what is it that you do? We're both um, qualified accountants and we work in yeah. the fund industry. Yeah, we I'm a financial controller in a wonderful private business. And I head up the client services in Jersey. Um, that's okay. Great, great. And um, girls, how old are you? I'm nine. And I'm four. <laughs> right. What interests and hobbies do you have? What kind of things do you like to do as a family? As a family, I think we'd like to um, watch TV series, all sorts of TV series. Wait, we wait. just finished the next in fashion <laughs> last <laughs> they like, week. They like uh, binge watching Netflix at the moment. <laughs> Uh, that's part of their reading and um, because we also uh, watch Korean drama even though we don't understand Wonderful. Korean um, but I think we enjoy watching it as a as a family um, individually I think I like um, organizing things because I keep on watching Netflix about who made it and Marie Kondo so I think I'm getting addicted to clear yeah. containers right now <laughs> <So> <laughs> Coming to our house lately via Amazon. Um, Tally, what do you like to do? Um, I like to do drawing. Like to do drawing? What, what do you draw? Um, flowers. Flowers. Okay, how about drawing? Um, I like to do sports. Well, what sports do you like? Netball. Yeah. Excellent. What about me? <laughs> I just want resting, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding aside, yeah, I, I, I like uh, collecting a bit of antiques and yeah, a uh, bit of bit of walking as well. Oh, great! That's really cool. Ah, oh, so don't sit still for too long in your house, otherwise Lizette might organise you and pack you up and <laughs> tidy you away. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, and how is church important to you guys? Um. Obviously, church reminds us about that that God should be the center of our yeah. relationship and about family. Um, what I like about church lately is your innovativeness. So I, yeah. I was like really amazed how we adapt with this with this pandemic. I, I think they're good at technology and this um, initiative meeting the family. I really appreciate it because I actually. Uh, we know more people than we used to, Actually, <laughs> than yeah. we used to, to, to so thank you um, for keep on reaching out. And to, as um, well, I'd like the, um, the initiative of um, Mary and Margaret about sending sending the cards to to, to our small, to, to the sewing, saying hello. So it's it's really a nice gesture. Plus, yeah, it's uh, at least in this, um, in this pandemic, it's quite... It's quite nice, at least, even though we are we are not seeing each other physically, at least there's still contact. This is really nice. Yeah, it's good. Hopefully that, that through this and through Church Online, we're, we're making our community stronger and, and bigger as well. And, and hopefully getting to, to meet more people through, through that. And when we do get to finally meet together again, it'll be great because we'll know so many more people. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much for your time, guys. Um, I'll let you get on with your, your busy day. But thank you so much for your time. It's been really enjoyable getting to know you. Um, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank Bye. You. Thanks. Bye. It was so good to meet Jonathan and Lizette and their great kids. You know, Alice has been introducing Meet the Family for almost six months now and we have a way to go with the rest of church. So don't be surprised when you get a call from us inviting you on to meet the family. Over recent weeks, we've had a few work parties to lift and shift equipment 
from the old Le Canave School. As you know, Le Canave have partnered with us in our work out in Burkina Faso. As they opened up their new school, they realized that there was a whole lot of equipment no longer needed, and they wanted us to be able to take as much as we thought useful with us out to Burkina. We've had enough to fill a whole container and more. Chairs, signage that speaks of the heart and attitude towards learning. Projectors, printers, gymnasium mats, room dividers, all sorts of tools, sports equipment, desks, and two large trampolines, which I can't wait to see our children out in Burkina begin to enjoy and play on. I am so excited to see this partnership with the school develop over the years ahead and to see where the Lord takes us on this journey. So a massive shout out to all you who have helped in any way to get this stuff moved. It is so appreciated. What is also great has been the opportunity to catch up with people we haven't seen in a while. Now, Ben Opio was one such friend who I hadn't seen in a while. Now you will remember Ben as a guy who has a big smile and at this last work party, his smile was especially big. He was keen to share with me that he and his lovely wife, Angela, have just had a baby girl. Here is Hannah Kirabu Opio. The boys are loving their new baby sister. We thank God for Hannah's safe arrival and for this great family news. Can I keep encouraging to let us know what's going on in your lives? We are family and we're doing all we can to maintain meaningful connection. We had more exciting news this week. We are through to the next and last round of the Fiscal Stimulus Fund application. Please continue to stand with us in prayer, believing for this breakthrough of funds that will help significantly to transform Freedom Centre and the community around us. We are so excited for what this future can hold. Please also remember our home appeal. We are building a house and making it home. Please consider how you can be involved. Updates on the home appeal, fiscal stimulus, where we are and where we are going will be in the room and on Zoom towards the end of the month. So watch out for that date coming up soon. You know, there's a great scripture in Galatians 6 verse 9 that says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. In this portion of scripture, the Apostle Paul is encouraging and reminding the church of the importance of doing good to others. And he uses an agricultural principle of sowing and reaping. No farmer can expect a harvest if he is not planted in due time. Paul is encouraging the church and my prayer is that you are encouraged today to keep on planting and planning to do good, to love one another, to look for opportunities to keep building church and community. We're going to take an opportunity now to give. On your screens, you'll see the various ways in which you can give. And I want to say thank you, church, for the way in which you continue to stand faithfully with us and believing with us for all that God is calling us to. We give because he first gave to us a love for us so lavish that God did not spare his only begotten son, but he gave him up for us, dying for us, taking the penalty for our sin. We give so that a hurting world may know and have the opportunity of knowing Jesus. Amen. Well, it's time now to launch into our first week of 12 stones. So get your hearts, Bibles and notebooks ready as we step into the holiness of God.
My parents used to own an old Hillman Hunter. It was a red estate car. And the four of us children used to sit across the back row bench. We were in close proximity, so much so that when we exited the car, we needed mild surgery to help us get free from one another. One day we were in the back of this car doing a journey and we were listening to some fairly inane dance tune from the uh, late 80s. And mum and dad were complaining that the lyrics of our songs these days were pointless and contained nothing of value. Now they were super stoked when a Beatles song came on next on the radio. And that Beatles song was called Hello, Hello. And ironically, it read like this. You say yes, I say no. You say stop, I say go, go, go. Oh no, you say goodbye. And I say hello, hello, hello. Of course, the four of us in the back burst out laughing. The irony was not lost on us. But mum and dad at that moment had a penny dropping sensation. They realized that their music and its lyrics were as pointless as some of our music and its lyrics. I want to start with a penny-dropping moment. When the penny drops, our perspective changes instantly. We suddenly realize that something is to be understood differently. We're going to focus first on the mystery of God. So today we're going to look at Isaiah's encounter with God in the throne room. Isaiah has a vision of the Lord that is unparalleled in the scriptures. It says this in verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. Now in this verse, we're given a penny-dropping moment. Isaiah's eyes are fixed on Uzziah, the king, and then they are lifted up, to the eternal king. Now, King Uzziah uh, was the very picture of earthly power, of wealth and strength and judgment and majesty. And he merely whimpers into nothingness in this singular verse. In powerful contrast, uh, Isaiah's perspective is shifted to the Lord, who's seated on an eternal throne with all power and all majesty. The Lord is high and lifted up. We often get consumed by those things that are right in front of us. Now, we sometimes miss the wood for the trees. I often pray that God would give me his eyes to see what he's doing. In this verse, we see Isaiah's attention utterly captured by the Holy God. But what is holiness and how are we to understand it? Holiness is first expressed in mystery. Um, to even speak about holiness or try and verbalise holiness is impossible. We don't have the linguistic constructs. We don't have the human imagination to contain the nature or the words for God's mysterious otherness. A.W. Tozer wrote in his book, The Knowledge of God, neither the writer nor the reader of these words is qualified to appreciate the holiness of God. Quite literally, a new channel must be cut through the desert of our minds to allow the sweet waters of truth that will heal our great sickness. We cannot grasp the true meaning of the divine holiness by thinking of someone or something very pure and then raising that concept to the highest degree we're capable of. The mystery of God was revered by the Israelite people, has been upheld in Jewish tradition and, in fact, upheld in Christian tradition as well. 
The word Yahweh, the name for God, is a word that was not spoken by the Jews. It was too holy, too other than. And it's constructed of four letters, Y-H-W-H, which are four consonants of the ancient Hebrew language that represent the divine name of God given to Moses on Mount Sinai. This name has been variously translated over the years, starting with I am who am, or I am who I am. But it's difficult to translate this word. It consists of varied tenses of the Hebrew verb to be. In some ways, it also translates as who will, is, and who has been. Who will, is, and who has been. Even the name that God gave himself in human language contains an unfathomable otherness. The holiness of God is not boxable. It is shrouded in mystery and outside of human comprehension. So we move on in our scripture. I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. In this phenomenal encounter, Isaiah is reminded of the singularly unique kingship of God. There was no pantheon of other gods surrounding him, no other kings who were paralleled with him. He was ultimately and is ultimately the king of all. That's something great to remember for us. When things are happening on earth that are tough, it's good to remember that God is the king of all. And so the angels cried, holy, holy, holy. Uh, the Hebrew word used here for holy is kodesh. Kodesh, kodesh, kodesh. And it means apartness, set apartness, separateness, sacredness, purity, consecration. It refers to God's otherness, transcendent and totally other. So God here is shown to be above all creation. He's high and lifted up. There is a weight to his glory. There's no sin in him. He's transcendent, he's divine, and he's set apart. Now, I've been so challenged reading this passage again. Truth is, I'm impetuous. Um, I'm sometimes grumpy, I'm pretty impatient, often self-centered and or insecure. Reflecting on it, my behavior towards God has not really acknowledged his holiness often. I was lying in bed in Oxford in September and my heart had decided to go into its fourth arrhythmia in the space of a month. For the first three times, I had said to God, if you want me to come home now, I'm ready and want to be with you. Then on the fourth time, I said something that when I think back to it, sort of fills me with dread. I said to God, can you please make up your mind and make a decision? because I'm fed up of nearly dying. Subsequently, I've asked myself the question, why does God even tolerate my misunderstanding, my inability to comprehend? I fall so short. Now, I want to take a moment for us to listen to Psalm 8 and just let it wash over you.
Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, all the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So we move on to verse 5 of our scripture in Isaiah 6. It says this, And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then a seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he'd taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The otherness of God is to some extent reflected and articulated in the law of God. The Bible says the wages of sin are death. Sin is to deviate from the smallest element of the law. That ultimately means that we are all sinful. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here we have another eye-shifting moment. Isaiah's eyes move from the Lord to himself. It's another perspective shift. Isaiah was a good guy. He was a mouthpiece for God on the earth and in his generation. He ticked all the boxes. To others, he would have looked very holy. But no matter how well we behave, in the presence of God, we cannot help but acknowledge our own fault, our own brokenness, and our own sin. Repentance is necessary. But it's not just a necessity reserved for the most sinful of us. It is a gift to each one of us. Confession and repentance is a gift to everyone. Justice is getting what you deserve, isn't it? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is being given what you don't deserve. Now here, the mercy of God liberates Isaiah from his unclean lips. Ironically, then God sends him to be his mouthpiece. Now, when by the power of the Holy Spirit, we encounter anything of a true revelation of the holiness of God, our own sinfulness is fully exposed to us as well. We can't help but see the contrast. But God's heart is mercy to us through the work of Jesus to make us right with him. My favorite way to think about this is that each of us is like a house. We have a garden and in that garden for years, we've been throwing waste and uh, white goods that we don't use anymore and are rusty. Um, there's an old boat in there, some boots and maybe a few sofas. And this junk has been built up and built up in the back garden to the point where we cannot even get out of the back door 
and we definitely can't go and enjoy the sun. And it's like Jesus has driven to our front door with a flatbed truck and willingly offers to himself remove the rubbish from the back garden so that we can again enjoy that space. He offers it freely and because of his effort and his work, not because of ours. Confession and repentance is an absolute gift to each one of us, a gift that liberates us as Isaiah was liberated with the hot coal from the fire. Now I want to ask you today, maybe you want to pray with me as I ask God for forgiveness. As I repent of my sin and ask him to give me mercy and liberate me from my own sin. Father, thank you for this time today. Thank you that you love us, that you lead us to repentance. Thank you, Lord God, that your heart is for mercy. Lord, I offer you my sin. I offer you the rubbish in the backyard of my life. And Jesus, I ask you to take it away now. In your holy name, amen. Heaven's mercy seems. 
dark wonder at the mention of your name filled with wonder awestruck wonder at the mention of your name Thanks so much, Kirsten, for leading us in worship today. And Tim, for that amazing truth in opening up the mystery, majesty and mercy that is the holiness of God. There is an incredible truth to ponder this week. The mercy of God expressed in the gift of Jesus in salvation. We hope you have a great week. Stay safe, look out for one another, be in touch, and we'll see you real soon. Bless you.